Truth Espresso, episode 57. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Well, hey there, this is Daniel Minnick, and welcome to another exciting episode of Truth Espresso. We are continuing a series talking about abortion, and we're looking to bringing some closure to the issue by showing how the Word of God would bring closure to the issue of abortion. And we talked about lots of different things. We talked about abortion procedures and some of the gory details that we tried to minimize a little bit for our audience, but we did address some of the hard realities of abortion. We talked about how abortion can even relate to racial and socioeconomic issues. We talked about the philosophies of abortion. We talked about answering questions from pro-abortion arguments. We also talked about some of the challenges from very hardened pro-abortionists bringing up philosophical arguments that take into account that the unborn are truly human, but that somehow their rights are not enough to trump the rights of those who would seek their death. And now we're going to see what the Word of God says about abortion. We're going to challenge our thinking a little Little bit and really think about worldviews. Is there such a thing as ultimate truth, absolute truth? This abortion debate has been raging on for hundreds or even thousands of years. But does that mean that there's no truth at all in this? Does that mean basically it's like my kung fu can lick your kung fu? I mean, is it really just the prevalence of one argument that one-ups another argument and the last person standing is the winner? Is that really how the abortion debate will be solved or not solved? Well, my wife Chelsea is with me again for this episode of Truth Espresso, and we're going to talk about matters of the gospel and absolute truth as it relates to abortion, and we believe that absolute truth exists and that there for there is an absolute solution to abortion from the word of God and from the gospel and from the hope that we as human beings can find from God as he reveals himself in his word. And so, Chelsea, welcome back to Truth Espresso. Hello, and thank you for having me back again. So, Chelsea, we talked about answering the question, what is the unborn, in a previous episode, and the logic of that is absolutely sound. But it seems like some people still are not willing to accept that, and science demonstrates that the unborn is fully human, and that it is completely illogical and irrational to try to put a relative point in time in which the unborn becomes human or becomes a person. Science demonstrates, biology demonstrates, that human life begins at conception, and the question, what is the unborn, and the answer to it demonstrates fully that it follows logically that if the unborn is fully human, therefore the unborn has just as much a right to live intrinsically as an individual human being as any human being outside the womb. But here is a question that even follows that one. So, we answer the question, what is the unborn? And if it's fully human, it has just as much a right to life as anyone outside the womb. But really, why even does that matter? Like, how do we make the case that human life itself is valuable? Before I give my answer to that, do you have anything to say about that? Why should we regard human life as valuable? 
Yeah, so I like how you recapped our discussions before about what is the unborn and how we demonstrated that the unborn is a human from conception and a person and deserves a chance at life. And not only that, we saw that through science and even through logical reasoning, but we also mentioned briefly how the Bible even describes that life begins at conception and that the unborn is a human being and they deserve life. And so I think that today we're going to address that topic even more about how the Bible, uh, God's Word, can ultimately give us the direction in the pro-life argument and how it defends the humanity of the unborn. I recall in the book of Luke where John the Baptist is in his mother's womb and he leaps for joy when Mary comes close by. And that's just a great reminder of just the human life that was inside the mom at that time. They didn't have ultrasound technology then. They didn't have all the advancements that we have now where you can see inside the womb. But even at that point, there is that human life there and leaping for joy, showing just the fullness of life that was already present. Yes, Chelsea, that's definitely a, a wonderful inference from the Word of God and the, the account of John the Baptist leaping in the womb, showing the joy of life, and that the unborn in the womb moving around is something truly marvelous to behold. Now, we talked about the question, what is the unborn, and we answered it. Let's say you're an atheist. I know you're not, Chelsea, you, <laughs> but let's, for the sake of argument, let's say you're an atheist, and in an atheist worldview, you could even be convinced by the logic that the unborn has just as much a right to life as someone outside the womb, but as an atheist, you could also come to the conclusion that the so-called right to life of humanity isn't even something that actually matters, because humanity in and of itself has no intrinsic worth or value and so even if someone has a right to life it's still not valuable or something that actually matters and so we we should be able to ask the question then why is human life valuable why is the life of the unborn or the life of those who are born valuable if we look at Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6 from the Word of God, which is our standard for truth, God says in his word, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. God is making a statement about humanity and about the worth of a human being. He says that it's murder to kill another human, and if you kill someone else, you murder someone else, then you yourself should be killed because it is a moral wrong to do that. But what was God's reasoning for that? God actually gave a reason. He answers a question. He gives a because. He says, for in the image of God made he man. If a human being kills a cow, God does not say this is murder and therefore your life is required of you. He says if you shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed because he created man in his image. And so being an image bearer of God is the reason for why human life is valuable. In the atheist worldview, why would murder be wrong? Why would abortion be wrong? Why should we, in an atheistic worldview, consider killing another human any different from killing an ant? If you were to ask an atheist, the answer could be whatever arbitrary relative philosophy of the day just happens to be. Because it has measurable negative effects on our species as a whole to survive, or it is just as quote-unquote wrong for an ant to kill another ant as for a human to kill another human, so it's some kind of relative thing, or maybe even somehow we evolved with this sensitivity that we think it's morally wrong to kill other human beings, and that the reason just has to do with survival 
of the species, but it's not some kind of absolute intrinsic wrong for any one given act of a human being to kill another human. It's just a convention of the mind, perhaps an illusion. So, without an absolute standard, how do we understand that abortion is wrong? How does the issue of abortion matter? And if we present to a hardened atheist that the unborn is fully human, what is there also to show that atheist that therefore the unborn deserves the protection of life? I mean, the atheist might even think, I myself don't even deserve any protection of life because I have no intrinsic worth. So we do things out of convention, but in the grand scheme of things, there is no absolute way of determining that it's absolutely wrong for one human to kill another human. So this is definitely an interesting argument that you brought up, and I think it's really easy for people to dismiss value, especially when it's something that you can't see. And thankfully, with the advances in the medical field and technology and the ultrasound machine, we can see right into the womb and see the miracle of life right before our eyes. And this is a powerful tool that we can use to show women that there is a living human being inside of them. And a lot of times when women are faced with their unplanned pregnancy and they come to a pregnancy center to determine if they're pregnant or not, and they're unsure about what they're feeling about this pregnancy. Uh, They might be feeling overwhelmed or scared or just a lot of pressure from family or friends or their boyfriend, and they're not quite sure what to think about being pregnant right now. And they might even say, well, it's just a blob of tissue, or I just can't think of this right now. I need to continue with my schooling, or I won't be a good parent. We see all sorts of different stories. But once we show them the ultrasound and they can put that picture to what's actually going inside of them and see that baby moving around in there, seeing that heartbeat in there, a lot of these women, just that picture moves them. I know um, a few years ago, Focus on the Family did a study to see how many women actually changed their mind about abortion because of seeing this image on the ultrasound. And it was over 80% of women would change their minds just by seeing the ultrasound. And not that the ultrasound is the only thing that we need to show them, but it is a truth that comes right before their eyes that is not a blob of tissue. That baby has arms and legs and you see the heartbeat and you can see the eye sockets and you can see the little finger bones and it's just really amazing to see that and to see how that connection between mom and baby really softens her heart as well. So I think that that is one way to demonstrate truth and demonstrate value is just showing these women that there is a human being inside of them through the use of the ultrasound. And then secondly, to talk about value is just, again, going back to God's word. And God's word is our standard of truth. And in his word, it says that we are valuable. We are his. And he knows us by name. And I think that if we just remember that we are valuable, God made us in his image, that that will bring a lot of people to the truth that all human life does have value. Amen there, Chelsea, and that's a good point about the ultrasounds and what is seen and when people actually see more of the truth. You know, the Word of God talks about, open our eyes that we may see marvelous things. The Apostle Paul talks about opening the eyes of our understanding. And so the evidence of what God has done in creation and providing us with intrinsic value as human beings is right there. I mean, it's it's not something that we have to prove exhaustively in a way that we have to write a dissertation to show that human life is worth something and pictures worth a thousand words and you see an ultrasound and God gave us emotions and God gave us logic and so intrinsically as human beings with conscious awareness we can look at an ultrasound and see that baby moving around and we get emotions from it love caring nurturing 
And that's not something that we have to just logically think through, and that's evidence of itself that God created us unique as human beings to see pictures like that and to see intrinsic worth in human beings intrinsically ourselves. We know it to be true, and so to deny that is the realm of human logic that goes against what God has revealed to be true. And so when it comes to the philosophies of this world, the only ultimate solution to abortion requires an ultimate foundation or the ultimate foundation of absolute truth. And the source of that is God himself via his word. And so when I say God, I don't say a God that probably exists, some higher power, whatever name or features you might want to give him or it. I'm talking about the Yahweh God of the Bible. When I say God, that's what I mean. I don't mean some impersonal force or some personless intelligent design. I mean the one true God who exists. And the word of God that God has revealed does not bring us to question if God exists. The word of God that God has revealed presupposes God's existence and therefore presupposes the value of human worth. As I mentioned, Genesis 9-6 presupposes the murder of human beings is wrong because we're created in the image of God. And that presupposes, obviously, the existence of the God who created created us. And so how do we know absolutely that abortion is wrong? We look at Proverbs 1 verse 7. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so let us even think about this statement. Let's ask ourselves the question, is this statement true? Is the fear of the Lord the beginning of knowledge? If the Bible is possibly true, only possibly true, and that God possibly, only possibly exists, then this statement is false. If for this statement to be true, God must exist, and this must be the word of God. So if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, then knowledge presupposes God. It cannot be anything else, because if the statement is false then we have a conundrum on our hands. We have to say that this statement is wrong. And it mentions fools. On the contrary, they despise wisdom and instruction, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if the statement is wrong, then the writer of the statement becomes the fool and not the fool mentioned in the statement. But if the statement itself is foolish, then God wouldn't exist, but then we have to define fool, and really there's no absolute definition of fool. There's no absolute beginning of knowledge. So when we come to the Word of God, we understand that there is an absolute source of truth that would tell us the absolute solution to abortion, and that abortion is wrong not just because we feel so, or we think so, or it probably might be so, but it is absolutely wrong because absolute morality exists, and absolute knowledge exists, because an absolute God absolutely and necessarily exists. Wow, that's a lot to take in, but very enlightening about thinking through moral relativism and that we can't ignore the truth that God has revealed to us. A verse that I actually just read tonight that was kind of interesting too is, was Hosea 4, 6, and it says, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And it's just interesting with your verse from Proverbs that you brought up too, that a lot of people almost enjoy living in ignorance because if they know truth, if they know knowledge, then they have to actually deal with it. And unfortunately, that, like the verse says, is destroying our nation and is destroying people and destroying lives. Yes, amen, Chelsea. And what you hear there in the background is an intrinsically valuable life of a baby. (laughs) 
And so, yes, uh, God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And it's not because they tried to find knowledge and couldn't find it. The knowledge of God is always available, but people don't seek it, as Romans chapter 3 makes clear. And so I want to get into, really, to ask the question, well, if it's obvious that abortion is murder and murder is morally wrong and it's an absolute truth, why do some people still insist, even when presented with logic and evidence, like, do they just need more evidence? Some people, you can show pictures of what abortion looks like, all the gruesome details, and they still cling to abortion. And when they try to argue with you, the arguments are relative. They're arguments about economic issues or inconvenience and stuff like that. So it's like they know the truth about abortion. But they still reject the truth because of the noetic effects of sin, the the fall on the mind of the human. And we see that the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8.22, For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And God didn't create it that way, but because of the fall, we see all this groaning, we see all this imperfection, we see all this pain. But then the argument is that we actually know that there is such a thing as perfection. Without an absolute standard, people are left to thinking, well, all this pain and groaning is just the way things are. That's the way things always were, always are, and always will be. And there's no reason or purpose for that. But the Word of God shows why we have pain and suffering, and it also shows how pain and suffering will ultimately be fulfilled and eliminated. So I also want to get into another passage that shows the corruption of human hearts against the obviousness of the truth. Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Now, what about that first statement? The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Now, obviously, if it were possible that there was no God, we just think there might be a God. Maybe the evidence points to the greatest probability that a God of some kind might exist. Well, if that were true, then this statement is false. Because how can someone be foolish to say in his heart there is no God if there's even the possibility that there is no God? That statement would be false. And therefore, the fool would be the one who said this statement. But then we're left with the problem that, well, what then is a fool without an absolute standard coming from the absolute God? It says they are corrupt. Well, what does that mean? How do we understand what the word corrupt would even mean if we don't have anything absolute for which to understand corrupt? They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Now what is good? How do we understand what good is in an absolute sense according to what this statement is saying if good is a relative term? I mean, because all of us humans, we are not infallible. We do not possess all knowledge in our minds. If we're to ask one human being what is good and another human being what is good without the absolute standard of God's word, we can come up with ten different opinions on what is good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So this is God's statement about humanity and the plight that we all face with the corruption of our minds because of the fall. And so if we're not thinking God's thoughts after him, if we're not putting God as the ultimate standard, we don't recognize that God is the ultimate standard, which would understand that, of course, abortion is absolutely wrong. Then we see the plight here that no one does good according to God's definition of good, which is the only valid definition of good. 
Now let me dig further with this as we read Romans chapter 1 and verses 18 through 22. We see that not only is God the ultimate standard and that God exists, but everyone knows this to be true in some form in the deep recesses of their mind. There is really no such thing as an absolute atheist according to the absolute word of God. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, or Godness, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, if you don't fear the Lord, if you don't acknowledge the God that you know must exist for anything to make sense, and it's revealed in the creation, it's manifest among you that God exists, so that you have no excuse, then if you refuse to acknowledge this, you refuse to embrace what God has revealed, then you are a fool according to God. But remember, without God, we can't even define what a fool even means. After listening to you describe what a foolish man is and that we are without excuse because God has revealed himself, it's reminded me of a couple different situations with women who found themselves in an unplanned pregnancy. So the first situation I'll share is a mom who is going into the Planned Parenthood clinic just for a consultation and to get some more information about her own planned pregnancy. And unfortunately, Planned Parenthood is really good about talking women into having the abortion or going through with it. And this mom was scared. She didn't know much about pregnancy. She didn't know much about what was actually going to happen with the abortion. Um, she was told that this was the best thing for her and for her baby. Well, of course, they didn't use the word baby. So this was the best thing for her and the situation she found herself in. She just needed to take these couple of pills and go home. And then in a few days, everything will be great and she can just go on with her life. And in this situation, this young girl, unfortunately, is being taken advantage of because she doesn't know everything as far as what is going on. And Planned Parenthood is withholding truth from her and they are knowingly deceiving her. And a second situation I was thinking of was a girl who came to the pregnancy center and was not sure how far along she was in her pregnancy. And then we did the ultrasound and found out she was 15 weeks along. And as soon as she saw that baby there, she was astonished. She's like, wow, that is my baby. There's no way I could consider an abortion after seeing this. It's amazing to me how the truth of the ultrasound and seeing what that baby was inside of her led her to make a decision to choose life. And so thankfully this mom did choose life for her baby once she was shown truth and once she knew more about what was actually going on inside of her. And just thinking about that situation, if she was shown that truth and she decided to go ahead and go to Planned Parenthood again and have an abortion at that point, then she would be considered what the Bible is talking about as a fool because now she knows the truth and yet she's going to ignore that truth and go ahead and proceed with abortion, which would kill her baby. Yeah, Chelsea, that's an amazing account of how God reveals truth. And as pro-lifers, based on the word of God, 
there's no doubt about the truth of what we're talking about, about abortion and human life. And as you'd explain the way a lot of um, people at Planned Parenthood, especially the higher up you go, the more experience you have there, the more you're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. You know, they know the truth about what they're doing, but because their foolish hearts are darkened and they profess to be wise, they become fools and they're just looking to make money off of something that they know is murder. And it's completely clear in creation that human beings are different from all other creatures and that we have God consciousness. We have an understanding of morality. And to think that that's just a natural thing, then we could just be deluded. It could be an illusion that, you know, it's just some trick of our mind that has evolved over time that we think that human have value and that aborting a baby is something that's wrong and would give people grief and some pro-life advocates try to tell people that there's no reason that we should feel grief over abortion, especially women, and that those who do feel it, it's, it's some kind of weakness and that maybe has come from the patriarchy and that to be a true woman and to break free of the evil influence of men control them, then that's all that their inclinations toward guilt over abortion is just some historic precedent of men deluding them with their power, and that to break free and become truly women and have the power that women possess, it's to rid themselves of that illusion of guilt. I liked that story, babe, that you were telling me from that book the other day. The walls are talking and how that woman was actually almost proud of her multiple abortions. Did you want to go ahead and share that story? Uh, Yeah. uh, So in Abby Johnson's book, The Walls Are Talking, it talks about former abortion clinic workers telling their stories and why they changed their mind on abortion because they were confronted with truth. And one of these abortion workers, who was pro-abortion, of course, at the time, working in an abortion clinic, had an experience where there was a client that she called Angie to protect her identity. But this Angie woman was coming in for her ninth abortion and she was acting nonchalant about it in fact she was making many of the abortion clinic workers uncomfortable because she was treating it like this performance she was doing she was kind of mocking the idea of people feeling uncomfortable about it she was ready to perform in fact she even denied sedative treatment because she was going to show that she didn't need this this wasn't a medical procedure procedure even to her. This was something to boast about and prove how tough she was and how routine this was. The writer of this one chapter in in the book, talking about her experience, showed that she and other abortion clinic workers were actually getting turned off and uncomfortable and almost like inside wanted this Angie to feel uncomfortable about the abortion. Like she should have some regret. I mean, come on, this is her ninth one. Even to someone who provides abortions, she wanted this woman to feel some level of guilt for coming in for number nine and the woman did have that ninth abortion unfortunately and then while still acting cocky in the waiting room after having it done and trying to tell other patients there who just had their abortions that there's you know nothing to be concerned about or grieve about and how proud she was to have it done that abortion clinic worker came out to follow up and Angie grabbed her arm and you know with a smile said you mind if I see it I just want to look at it and you know so the clinic worker went to the products of conception room and she was used to seeing the baby parts there but then she wasn't sure if she should basically plop them on the plate or arrange them to shape out the baby it's kind of gruesome to think about and this clinic worker was kind of hard-hearted herself about it but there was no formal requirements for how to present it and it's almost out of spite for this frustrating 
exceedingly overconfident client, she decided to put the baby parts together to form the whole baby and then brought that out to Angie, even though this was something that she had never experienced as the clinic worker had never experienced having a patient who wanted to see it. And the workers usually wanted to make sure not to show them because, oh no, that would be influencing people's minds and you can't have that. It's better to keep truth from them. So the clinic worker showed Angie the plate and her smile quickly changed as she actually saw it and she started to say, that's my baby. That's a baby. That's my baby. And I can't even imagine what was going through her mind at that time, seeing that, seeing the shock, all of a sudden getting guilt and then realizing I've done this nine times now. And so she ended up on the floor bawling and she became quite the emotional mess. And then she went into the bathroom and locked herself in the bathroom. The clinic worker was trying to get her out and she was begging, Angie was begging to take the aborted baby home and put it in the freezer, almost like a last ditch effort to relieve some of her guilt. And basically they had to call the police to get her out of the bathroom because she was staying in there for over an hour. And so that goes to show that the truth is there, but some people suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And it's obvious what the truth is, and a lot of people will support abortion by suppressing the truth. Uh, yeah, every time you tell me that story, it just makes you just, wow. That poor woman who had to go through all of that and then come to the realization that that was her baby and those were her babies and it's just really heartbreaking and so as i'm presenting all this harsh reality my intention is not to be condemning my intention is not to make people angry and as i read those verses and pushed home the point of absolute truth and the god who absolutely exists and is the source of knowledge my intention is not to beat it over people's heads like a hammer on a nail because from the source of all knowledge god comes the source of hope and truth and so i want to shift it over to how this truth brings hope. I want to talk about the positive things. Well, first, we want to get into why the gospel is the ultimate solution to the issue of abortion. Because it's all about a worldview. You know, when people say, I need to see more evidence of God. Well, all of creation is evidence of God. We can zoom in to the tiniest particle of an atom and how small that is relative to us. And then we can zoom out to the size of the earth, to the size of the solar system, to how many stars there are in the Milky Way galaxy, how infinitesimally small we are as a speck there. And then how many galaxies there are, how many trillions of trillions of stars there are, and it makes us look insignificant. And so when we even think of abortion in terms of that, it seems like it doesn't matter if the entire human race were to be wiped off the face of the earth without us being created in the image of God and show that we actually do have worth. And so the evidence is there. It's just a matter of, will people accept what the evidence absolutely demonstrates? Now, an atheistic worldview can't answer that, but the Christian worldview presupposes the answers to ultimate questions of philosophy come through God as he has revealed himself. And the gospel is central to the Christian worldview. God absolutely does exist, and God is perfect, and his law for us as image bearers of him is perfect and holy. Proverbs 17.15 says, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. And so there is absolute right and absolute wrong, and you don't call what is right wrong or what is wrong right because they are absolute. And the Bible demonstrates for us that 
We are all sinners. We have all broken God's law. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we all think with imperfect minds. We evaluate truth even through depraved sinful minds. But God has revealed the truth such that we can recognize it even in our imperfect state. But yet 1 John 4.2 says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is of God. So why is this important? Why does it matter who this Jesus Christ is, and why does it matter that he is come in the flesh? Why does that matter to God? Well, because the Bible reveals that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is the second person of the triune God. He is the divine Son of God who is come in the flesh. He took on a full human nature such that he is one person, the person of the divine Son of God with two natures. He's fully God and fully human. And so why does this matter? Why would he do that? Galatians 3.13 says that Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And so Jesus Christ was born of a virgin Mary. He was born. He was conceived. And so that shows the intrinsic value of human life because God saw fit to redeem us by the Son of God coming as a man, taking on humanity, experiencing humanity in every stage. And Chelsea, we watched a message by Dr. Vodi Baucom where he talked about this, how Jesus Christ is the proof that God has vindicated the worth of humanity because he created God in his image, but then he also took that on himself. He was conceived. He went through all stages of pregnancy. He was born he grew up as a child, he experienced the sufferings in this life and the pains and temptations, and he went to the cross and he was perfect. He obeyed God's law perfectly, and so he was the only representative of humanity that was never a sinner. And because of this, Jesus Christ, the God-man, could then be the spotless lamb and reconcile God to man. According to Isaiah 53, verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So this shows that although we are sinners, we are condemned by God's law. We are condemned by absolute morality to be sinners, and we deserve punishment from God, eternal separation from God. But because of Jesus Christ, who is the incarnate Son of God, and lived a perfect sinless life, that qualifies him to be our substitute. God vindicated the value of human life by the incarnation of the Son of God as Jesus of Nazareth. He reconciles humans to God by being both fully God and fully human himself. He lived a sinless life, obeyed the divine law perfectly. Thus, he could be the substitute for our sins. If he had sinned himself, he could only pay for his own sins. But because he is the perfect God-man, then he could be the substitute for our sins. And then that therefore gives us hope. And as Christians, we recognize that Jesus Christ is the ultimate revelation of God's truth. According to 2 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 20, the Apostle Paul said, But as God is true, now there is the ultimate statement there, But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us.
And so all of reality is summed up and focused on proclaiming Jesus Christ as the ultimate revelation of truth. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is the ultimate revelation of the progress of God's revealed truth. Colossians 1.17 says, And he, referring to Jesus Christ, is before all things, and by him all things consist or hold together. And so Jesus Christ is very important in the word of God because without Jesus Christ, even all things would not hold together. Truth would not even be complete without the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we have hope. And so that's why there is an ultimate answer to abortion because human life has ultimate value. And the gospel is what gives us value and hope that we can look forward to in this wretched world of fallen sinfulness. And so I'd like to end by saying that because of the gospel, that means there is absolute truth. That means that God created me and you in his image. That means that human's life is endowed with intrinsic worth. And that means that murder is objectively wrong. That means that my existence has design, purpose, and worth. I am created for God's glory. That means that sin actually is objective. That means we can define what sin means. That also means that we can understand what salvation from sin means. That means that Jesus Christ was an actual human being who existed in history and that he is the incarnation of the Son of God. That means that his death can be my death, his resurrection can be my resurrection. And that also means that if you have had an abortion, that means that there is forgiveness because the cross of Jesus Christ is the proof that sin was paid for by Jesus Christ and that you can find your hope in the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And he bore sin on your behalf. And that therefore there is forgiveness from the sin of abortion, but forgiveness and resolution of abortion cannot simply come by turning a new leaf and trying to live a better life to the best of what an atheist can offer you. The ultimate solution to abortion and forgiveness from abortion Wiping that record clean and being reconciled to God, although the pains of it will continue to exist in this life, there's always going to be regret, there's always going to be guilt in this life, but you can be freed from that, and you can be freed to know that the gospel will forgive everything all of your sin, and that one day, because of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection on your behalf, that you can be resurrected with him, you can be glorified with him, and all of your tears and all of your sin will be wiped away, and you will live forever in perfect harmony with Christ. You will never, once resurrected, have to worry about guilt and sin and pain and death ever again. Because without that hope, there is no meaning or purpose to death. There is no meaning or purpose to sin. And there is no meaning or purpose to abortion or even to the pro-life position without the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I hope that this has encouraged you really to think about truth. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can do that now. You can call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, as Romans 10, 9 says. Just confess to Jesus that you recognize that you are a sinner, and you now realize that his death pays for your sins, that you can be reconciled to God, and that Jesus Christ did die on your behalf, that Jesus Christ is your only hope, and you can have hope. Amen and amen. Thank you for waking up with Truth Spresso. 
Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.